Okay, I think we're live. So um, I am going to go ahead and get started here. So um, I'll introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Dara Blackwater. I am an indigenous connectivity advocate. Um, I am originally from Farmington, New Mexico. I just graduated from um, law school in May from the University of Arizona studying telecommunications law and indigenous people's law. Um, and I'll go ahead and introduce myself in Navajo. I'm a citizen of the Navajo Nation. So, Dare Blackwater Yunishia, Beshwachan Initiative, Adult Senatuni Bashin, Adult Beshwachan Indash Che, Adult Hach Ini Dashinale. And next, I will introduce our honored guest. So, I am so, so honored to be here with you. Um, for those of you who don't know, we have Jessica Rosenworcel, who is a commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission with us today. Welcome and thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Dara. It's a treat to be here at RightsCon, to be here with you uh, virtually. And I'm gonna just give a few opening remarks just to sort of set the stage. First of all, it is a privilege to kick off what's become really the world's leading summit on human rights in the digital age. And, you know, these are historic days. We've got this public health emergency that has exposed the fragility of our lives. It's shattered economies. We've got protests calling for a reckoning over systemic racial injustice. And I think we need connections now, both physical and digital, that strengthen our mutual bonds, remind us that our fates are united and that our interdependence is powerful. And you know, if you want evidence, just look around because around the world, this pandemic has made internet access move from nice to have to need to have. And in the United States, an online connection is now essential to maintain some semblance of modern life. As a nation, we've moved online for education, for healthcare, for commerce, and so much more. Now, I think it's incumbent on us to figure out how to extend this essential technology to a new decade and eventually to a post-pandemic era. So get ready because we have a lot of work to do on that front because we've learned that while this formidable tool can bring us together, it can divide us too. We know we need to do more to combat. We, I just wanna make sure I'm back, all right. Uh, we know we need to do more to combat misinformation, violent content and hate online. And we are still struggling with a set of fundamental rights like the right to free speech, the right to free press, the right to assembly and the right to association and what they truly mean online. I know it's not easy, but you see, I'm an optimist. I think gatherings like this, even virtually, are places where we're gonna move that blueprint forward, where we're going to advance the idea that we can connect more people in more places around the world, and we can do so in a way that is safe, trustworthy, and inclusive of everyone who wants to participate. Because human rights and democracy are not just principles for the physical world. They need meaning in the digital world too. And so today in the United States, we have an opportunity to help do just that. And I think we should seize it. And if you're wondering what I mean by that, well then roll back with me to May 28th of this year. And I'm gonna explain. You see on May 28th, the president of the United States signed an executive order. And under this order and at his direction, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, which is part of the Department of Commerce, is filing a petition today at the Federal Communications Commission where I work. And in this petition, the administration asks the FCC to come up with rules moderating online content. And we're told to do so using a law known as Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996. Okay, so how did we get here? Well, let's start with Section 230. It's a law that offers internet companies protection from liability for their content their users post. Section 230 has been called the 26 words that created the internet and it has helped free expression flourish online for decades. But like most things with the internet, it has its supporters and its detractors. It is those who wanna see it continue in its current form and others who wanna see it adjusted to reflect the new realities of this digital age. But if you look far and wide, you really aren't going to find a community that believes having the FCC use Section 230 to regulate speech online is the way to go. Now still, the administration is insisting. 
Because remember, at the highest level of our government, we've had rants about social media bias and accusations that certain companies are stifling speech. But here's the thing. The First Amendment is not present to protect the president from media. It's present to protect media from the president. Nonetheless, those rants eventually found their home in an executive order, and that brought this issue to the FCC today. Now, as a commissioner, I don't think the FCC should take the bait. While social media can be frustrating, turning the FCC into the president's speech police is not the answer. The FCC needs to reject this effort to deploy the federal government against free expression online. In fact, I think if we want to honor the Constitution, the agency needs to do so immediately. Now, I worry my colleagues at the FCC won't do that. I also worry that this petition is not just about changing the law, because any legal expert worth their salt will tell you that changing the law like this is not the job of a regulatory agency like mine. It's the job of Congress. And I think our colleagues at the NTIA and the administration know that. But even just proposing something like this has consequences because governments that threaten to chill speech can discipline private sector actors without changes in law ever becoming necessary. So what we have here is this invitation from the president for the FCC to help chill online speech and organize it in his favor. We need to reject it loud and clear. Because you, the way I see it, in the United States, we are a democratic open society in which people can hold their government accountable, even if imperfectly. Whether we can keep it that way depends on the survival of a robust, independent digital space for activism and public discourse. Those spaces only thrive if we say no to the president's invitation to make our networks less open and more closed to civic debate. Now, I think the American people actually know right from wrong. They know free expression from government censorship and real change from baser rhetoric and rants. I think when we get the facts organized and mobilized, we make progress. And progress right now means surviving the crises of the moment without sacrificing the values that have made us successful in the past. So we're gonna have to roll up our sleeves because we have work to do, because we want we not only want the benefits of the digital age to reach all, we want those benefits to foster human rights and dignity for all. And I think we can start in the United States by saying no to this petition that's been filed at the FCC today. So with those as my opening remarks, thank you. I hope we can get into some conversation, Dara. In fact, I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely, me too. Um, there are so many things that I want to ask you and talk to you about. Um, I feel like I've been making a list in my head for the past couple of years, um, but I've been making a list on paper for the past couple of days. And so I'm just going to dive right into it. Um, first though, I feel like I should address um, everything happening in the background and here, which is um, that I'm on the road right now. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, I'm actually walking the Colorado Trail, which is a 486 mile trail from Denver to Durango, Colorado, which is all on the ancestral homelands of the Southern Ute nations. And um, I'm doing it to actually raise awareness about the digital divide in indigenous communities, as well as just indigenous issues in general. Um, so if anybody is interested in um, seeing more about that or learning more about that, I am um, using Instagram mostly as my platform, which is my tag is at Blackwater Soul. And um, so it's not necessarily an apology, but an explanation of, uh, of the trail clothes and the hotel room. So uh, this is where we are in a little mountain town that uh, I found that the only place with fiber in about a 200 mile radius, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so, uh, so here we go. Um, you, so you're, today is a, a big day for section 230. And um, so at best, obviously what you said, the 26 words that made the internet, is that the same? Yeah. That's, yeah. I hadn't heard that one. It's being That's called that, yes. Sure. Um, so at, at best, you know, we are sit, we're talking about protection of freedom of speech and, and letting the internet be what it is and what we believe it to be. So um, at worst, we're protecting um, potential uh, dark, corners of the internet. Um, and I'm just curious, I, I know that there is one exception that they've made for sex trafficking, 
um, and that kind of holds offers more accountability for any pages that may um, that may you know promote that or allow that to happen. So what I guess I'm just curious about your idea if you could flesh out just kind of what what is the line and and what in your mind is the line of accountability versus freedom and, and how we hold people accountable um, and protect people while still allowing all the goodness that you're expressing that is on the internet for now? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's a big one too. I mean, yeah. it really goes at the heart of what does speech mean in the digital age? How do we use this technology to give voice to communities that haven't had the privilege of broadcasting to large segments of the public? But how do we also collectively decide to constrain misinformation, violence, and hate online? Yeah. Those are really hard issues, and it is imperative that we wrestle with them. Mm -hmm. But here's what's not right. We can't have the president via executive order telling the Federal Communications Commission to get in the business of mm -hmm. regulating content online and deciding what's okay to take down and what's not okay to take down. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the direction to us in this executive order is constitutionally fraught. Mm -hmm. We need to have Congress take a look at these issues. My regulatory agency has no business being in the business of articulating what's okay and what's not okay under section mm -hmm. 230 online. And furthermore, I think the tone of that executive order gets some things really backwards. Because in the end, the First Amendment is there to protect media from the president. It's not there to protect the president from media. Mm. I appreciate that, um, especially because it seems like you're offering a, just sort of a self accountability that um, maybe some people in an agency would want to take up all of the air in the room and all of the space that they can, where what it sounds like you're saying is this is this is a job for Congress, this is not a job for agency heads. And um, and if you were, didn't think about it that way, then maybe you would think that, that it was your job. And so um, it sounds like um, the self-awareness there is much appreciated. Um, so going forward from that idea, I want to talk a little bit about your remarks um, at the State of the Net conference that you made in, I think it was January in it DC. It feels like a long time ago, you know, those yeah, that pandemic was, days, right? Yeah, six years ago, January <laughs> this year. Um, so you talked about internet shutdowns and that being a huge issue. Um, and the example that you utilized was the Kashmir Valley and the internet shutdowns that were happening there and how these are really common actually around the world, um, especially around elections, which um, sounds very strategic. And so I, so going on in your remarks, you talk about 70, section 706 of the Communications Act, where um, essentially in the United States, this was a law that was made after World War II that gave the president the power to shut down wired communications, which at the time that was made meant what telegraphs and telephones um, and not the internet. Um, and so there's kind of this um, idea there that that law, that this antiquated law could apply to the internet today. So um, obviously this might be another call to Congress to amend a law, but what are your other ideas about how we can prevent internet shutdowns in America? Um, and and two, just, you know, would that ever be a good thing? Is there ever a, a scenario where that would be something we need the power to do? Yeah, more big questions. You know, one of the things I started doing was looking at internet shutdowns around the world. And I saw in the Kashmir Valley, they had done this for seven months and it affected 7 million people. And then I started looking around the rest of the world. We had shutdowns in refugee camps in Bangladesh. We had shutdowns associated with elections in the Congo. We had shutdowns associated with uh, student exams in Ethiopia. And what I learned is that these internet shutdowns are becoming more common worldwide. That's a problem for our interconnected economy, but it's also a problem for human rights. And I thought that could the United States positively participate in this by making that kind of assertion? And you know, the first thing that I thought I needed to do was probably study our own laws. What rules did we have on the books? And what struck me most was what you said, 
I found that old section 706 in the Communications Act of 1934 suggests that the president alone has the authority to shut down wired and wireless networks. And the way the law is written, it gives reasons like war, threat of war, public emergency or disaster. But in the end, those are radically vague terms, which means that a president could simply ask his or her attorney general to describe whether or not those preconditions had been met and then turn around and try to shut off wired or wireless networks. And I thought, well, that's my interpretation. Is it really outlandish? And I started studying and I found that in 2010, the Senate in the United States produced a report acknowledging that this right existed in the law. And mm. when I look at the state of the world and the state of this country, what occurs to me is that this law that was last updated after Pearl Harbor when telegrams meant communications yeah. needs an update. We need to have accountability from Congress and the judicial branch. We need to understand why in an emergency the president has this authority and what are the reasonable constraints we put on it? Because we live life online. That connectivity is powerful, it's democratizing. And finding out that one individual has a unilateral right to shut it off left me disturbed. So I gave a speech about it, as you said, at the State of the Net. I also wrote a shorter editorial about it in the Washington Post. And mm -hmm. um, I continue to believe it's something that Congress should take a look at because the scope of the president's authority in this regard is actually unbounded because the law is so old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of things you said there that um, kind of lead me to my next point. And I guess broadly, the, the we in We Live Our Lives Online are the people who have the privilege of being connected. And so um, kind of switching gears to, to my playing field of um, indigenous communities and especially rural indigenous communities, um, there's a couple different stats out um, floating around, I saw your op-ed in The Hill that you co-wrote with your, uh, Senator Kirsten Cinema about the tribal priority window, which is definitely something that I wanna swing back around to. But, um, you know, as far as internet sh shutdowns go, in this may sound, come across kind of backwards, but um, it, it's sort of a luxury to worry about your internet being shut down because there are so many people who don't have internet in the first place, who don't have internet access at home or anywhere near them. Many of those people living on in rural tribal areas, rural tribal lands. Um, the stat that uh, I've heard a lot is seven out of 10 homes on in rural tribal areas don't have any internet access whatsoever. And I know that you're well aware of this because not only do we have the term the digital divide, we also have the term the homework gap, which is something that you coined, which I really like because it gets to, um, it gets to really the, the meat of the issue that, that it's not that kids can't go to school and use um, their school, you know, like my, I'm from Monument Valley, uh, that's where my family is from, Monument Valley, Utah on the Navajo Nation. And um, they have good internet at the school and you often see cars parked in the parking lot to use that. But that doesn't get to um, the homework gap, which is what you're saying. And that's really where a lot of the issue is. So you've been outspoken about utilizing the E-rate programs and the Lifeline programs to help bridge this gap, this divide. Um, can you just kind of flesh that out for us of what that looks like, what your ideas are and, and how we can move them forward? Yeah, you know, um, in making the connection, I actually think internet shutdowns are related because if we say that you can't shut it down, we're saying it's essential. Uh -huh. And if it's essential, we've got to figure out how to get it to everyone. So I feel like these are actually part of the same principled argument, which is everyone needs access. If you don't have it, you don't have a fair shot at success. And as you mentioned, on some of our tribal lands, these are some of the areas in the country that have the lowest levels of deployment and adoption. And you also mentioned students, and this is particularly hits home for me. I mean, look, um, when I was growing up, I didn't need the internet to do my homework. I needed paper, a pencil, and my brother leaving me alone, right? It was yeah. like not more complicated. Yeah. But today, you know, seven in 10 teachers assign homework that requires internet access. But mm -hmm. you just mentioned tribal areas where seven out of 10 homes don't have it. Those kids fall mm -hmm. into this homework gap 
where they can't do nightly schoolwork. And now we have this pandemic. We sent millions of kids home and said, go to class online. But we've got as many as 17 million kids locked out of the virtual classroom because they fall into the homework gap. So we've got a big digital divide problem, as you know, because you're hiking across the state of Colorado to draw attention to it. And here's the thing, it is hard to solve. We've got to decide we're going to do it just as we did audacious things before, bringing plumbing and electricity to the far corners of this country. But I think the place we start right now is say, Every child should have an internet connection because if we get an internet connection to every kid that can go to school during this crisis and they can do their homework when we reach the other side. And for some kids, that'll be a connection in their homes. For others, it will be a wireless hotspot. But we need to make solving the homework gap a national priority. It affects rural America. It affects urban America we should come together and solve it. To me, that's the cruelest part of the digital divide and the one we need to be working on right now. So when we turn around and school starts again, we don't find that there are kids that are cut off. Sure. So in rural, it's, it's interesting because there's a, a lot of overlap between rural America and tribal America as far as um, this lack of connection and, and this, this issue of the digital divide and the homework gap. But the thing about tribal America is that there is a trust responsibility that the United States has to tribes. Um, and this is, this is a very important responsibility that uh, should be taken very seriously, even though we've seen it not taken seriously by many administrations and many, many um, agencies in lots of different decisions over the uh, centuries. So I'm curious how this trust responsibility, um, one, how it manifests in your job and just really in your mind as you're thinking about connecting uh, maybe rural lands versus tribal lands when there are limited resources, um, and two, just how that really changes the equation when we're thinking about connecting um, what we might call Indian country. Mm -hmm. Well, we do know based on available data that tribal lands are among the um, least connected places in this country. And we have a special responsibility with, um, we have a federal trust responsibility that the FCC memorialized back in 2000, 20 years ago in a policy statement about government to government relations and how we would navigate the um, legal issues, but also issues of respect associated with assisting with deployment on those lands. And I have to say that 20 years is a long time. It's kind of like a contract that needs renewal. Um, I, uh, I think it's worth the time, effort and energy at the FCC and other agencies that interact with tribal communities and essential facilities like this to actually restate those policy statements, recommit to them because it will force us to come up with fresh ideas about mm -hmm. how to address the lack of connectivity. But I also think when we do that, one of the things that gets to me is we always sit around and decry the lack of connectivity. It's important to do that, but it's just as important to demonstrate the places where things are working. Because you have to show people that there are some examples. Um, there are wonderful examples in New Mexico, for instance. I visited a tribal library with Congressman Ben Ray Lujan. And we even wrote about this library that the San Felipe Pueblo had first connected to the internet and how it changed the life of students and teachers in the community. And the library built this big porch out front because there were so many people coming to it to use it and it had changed the community. And they used FCC E-rate money to help do that on their own. Mm -hmm. And I think that example is so powerful because it shows that the good things can be done. And likewise, we have the Havasupi tribe in uh, Arizona which is the only one living below the, the rim of the Grand Canyon. So it's just like absolutely gorgeous. But you know, one of those things is like the more beautiful the land you're on, the less likely it's actually been right. wired because it's probably hard to do so. But that mm -hmm. tribe came to the FCC and sought a special temporary authority to get access to spectrum that was actually in the 2.5 gigahertz band. And they set up a system where they got folks wirelessly connected in their community by putting facilities in teachers and students' homes. 
And um, I think every time we sit around and we talk about uh, challenges on tribal lands, we have to also point to the things that are working. Because when you see examples of that kind of self-determination, I think you can multiply them. I think they can replicate. And I think we can grow connectivity as a result. Yeah, I absolutely love those examples. And I'm so glad that you brought them up because yes, they are absolutely so worthy of recognition, especially the people who did such hard work to make those happen, um, both on the policy end and on the physically, you know, I, I had the honor of going to um, uh, Hawaii last November with the Internet Society and uh, uh, another organization called MuralNet, nonprofit. And we helped set up their sovereign community networks. And so I got to see the policy side in law school, but I also got to see, you know, I also got to tighten the wrenches on uh, the base stations that were, this, you know, sh yeah, showing these, uh, spreading the internet to this community. And so um, there's so much hard work and so many people working so hard to bridge this divide. Um, and I think a lot of them would say that. Uh, you know, they love what they do and that they are happy to be doing that work and that they need the resources in able, to be able to complete the work that they're trying to do. So one of the things that I have written extensively about both in law school and, and in different office is about this, this idea of spectrum sovereignty is what I call it, tribal spectrum sovereignty. And um, for anyone who's not familiar with kind of this term of tribal sovereignty, um, it's that right now, as it sits, there are 574 federally recognized tribes within America. And so these are native nations that have been here since what we say time immemorial. And that means that they have been nations on this land since before the United States ever, you know, was con conceived of by found the founding fathers and mothers. So um, these native nations are sovereigns and they retain their resources. Um, this can be, you know, I've been hiking through watching the timber trucks come down, watching the mines, these open mines that, you know, we've been hiking by that they're pulling, they've pulled silver and copper and uranium out of for um, hundreds and hundreds of years, um, as well as water and coal and oil and gas. Um, so in my view, um, Spectrum is one of these natural resources because it has also been on the land since time immemorial. Um, I understand that that's not the view of the FCC or the US government and that's okay. Um, but I am curious about um, just what your plans are to help connect tribes with Spectrum, which is this necessary resource when we're talking about um, creating these networks on tribal lands, you need, they need Spectrum. And um, again, going back to your op-ed in the Hill with mm -hmm. Senator Sinema, um, you have suggested that tribes need more time to apply for these spectrum licenses. And so I'm just curious, um, I guess I'm looking for a bit of an insider's view and a bit of advice for tribal leaders um, who also need more, who are the ones who need that time um, to apply for the spe these spectrum licenses that are so important that will help them connect their people, their students, and really um, fill out their the room for self-determination and sovereignty. So um, what is your advice to them? Um, and what can we do to get more spectrum, to get more time to apply for spectrum? Uh, what, it, what are your thoughts? Well, let's start by talking about Let's be like full on um, female spectrum nerds and talk about the 2.5 gigahertz band. It is the sweet spot for current and next generation wireless. Here's why it, it has lots of capacity and it propagates far. It is the kind of stuff that a lot of our commercial companies want to build 5G infrastructure on. Yep. And so the FCC has a once in a lifetime opportunity for tribes that's happening right now. Where like the Havasupi tribe we just talked about, they can come and claim a license in that band over tribal lands or uh, rural uh, Alaskan uh, communities and also uh, Hawaiian homelands. And um, that's an extraordinary opportunity. That's the type of opportunity that needs to be seized. But when I started looking at the data we have, 
about this window for tribes claiming access to it, what I found was only about 15% of the eligible tribes had actually done so. And you know, it occurred to me that our window for claiming access to this spectrum was pretty much during the time of the coronavirus. Yeah. And something that struck me is the FCC has changed lots of deadlines for companies during this crisis. The FCC extended a spectrum auction in the 3.5 gigahertz band during this crisis. We even let a company that's been identified as a national security threat extend the time for its comments in a proceeding in this crisis. So with Senator Sinema, we said something that strikes me as painfully obvious. Let's extend time for tribes to get access to the 2.5 gigahertz span during this crisis. And you know, I don't think of that as something that's especially partisan. That idea has gotten support from Senator Sullivan in Alaska, Senator Warren in Massachusetts, and I wrote with Senator Sinema. Real cross-section of the public in our politics. But the idea that we want to see tribes have access to airwaves and do neat things with it is embodied in that opportunity. So why don't we extend the deadline? Because as you probably know, a lot of tribal communities are struggling with this virus right now. And to tell them when they're thinking about basic survival, well, go get your engineering studies ready, start mapping out where you put towers, start figuring out how you'd actually get capital to make this happen. I think we need to do them the courtesy of extending a deadline. We've done it for so many others who come before the FCC. Let's do it for tribes. Let's figure out how more of them can access these kind of opportunities by changing that deadline. Right now, the deadline is August 3rd. And um, if you care about this issue, please let my colleagues at the FCC know. Uh, I am um, relentless on this point and I'll be loud and noisy, but I'm gonna need their votes to make it happen. And I think it's important that we extend this deadline and do just that. I completely agree with you. And I'm, I'm just curious exactly because we have, I have um, you know, on my social media platforms, so many supporters and so many people who are, are always asking, how can I help? How can I help? Um, and I feel like this is a very, um, a very real way that people can mobilize to um, a, a very real answer to that question. So what exactly does that look like? Does that look like sending an email? Does that look like, uh, is there like an online forum? Oh, all of it. I believe okay. you make a ruckus to get things done. Let okay. myself and my colleagues at the FCC know, let your elected representatives know. I, um, I think noise is still powerful. So um, make it because the opportunities in the 2.5 gigahertz band for tribal communities are extraordinary. We have to make sure that during this crisis, they don't miss them and they get the opportunity to seize it. Okay, so um, I think what I will do um, is that I will put a post on my social media, um, my Instagram and my Twitter, um, with some of the language because there's a lot of you know spectrum and airwaves and a, a lot of just kind of confusing terms that we can nerd out on all day but uh, for someone who hasn't studied this extensively is a little bit overwhelming so um, again you can find me at Blackwater Soul on Twitter or Instagram and I will post some language um, mm -hmm. if that's something that our listeners are interested in um, mobilizing around because that would be a very very worthy and much needed cause um, and something very real that people can do in order to help this. And so specifically what we're saying is that um, the FCC is giving tribes, these 574 native nations, sovereign nations, the opportunity to apply for this really important and very useful spectrum that we can use to build networks on. And, but and internet window, access. So that, kids yes, can do their homework. So tribes can yeah. build their own businesses yeah. so that self-determination is really viable and connectivity grows in the communities that are least connected. Exactly. Um, and the, But there's a deadline and tribes, a lot of Native nations haven't been able to get their um, applications in because they have been closed a lot of the governments have been closed um our elders aren't meeting our tribal councils aren't meeting because of this pandemic and that and because they're not connected they can't do it virtually like we are right now um and so we really need a longer window 
for tribes to get this application in so that they can meet, so that they can do their government processes um, in order to get an application into the FCC, in order to get the spectrum that will allow them to set up networks and connect their students and their entrepreneurs and their artists. And, and this really gets to um, just one of the points that I, I think about so often. And as I've been walking days and hours and weeks, I've been thinking about this idea that um, it's not just that indigenous people need the internet. I truly believe that the internet needs indigenous people because these indigenous ideas that so many people are coming back to, whether it be um, you know, indigenous burn practices that are protecting our woods or whether it be indigenous food sovereignty um, of coming back to these foods that really nourish us or even these indigenous ideas around healing and and you know ceremony and and every the whole we call, in Navajo we call it hojon, which is just kind of like living your life in balance in a way that um, is walking in beauty is what it means. Um, people need these ideas now more than ever, and there are so many indigenous people right now who are doing such amazing art and making such beautiful, beautiful things, and who are just putting such beautiful words into the world and ideas and and sharing and. If they're not connected, it means that the world is also deprived from them and their beauty. And you know, we've seen we've seen how interested the world is in indigenous ideas because they appropriate it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but there's so much authenticity and genuinity that is that the world needs to see as well. Um, I so think that's important. really that's really beautifully put. And I think it's actually true worldwide. We talk about how difficult it is in the United States to connect people who aren't connected. We don't frame the conversation as a discussion of economic loss. What do we as a whole lose when we do not connect everyone? Mm -hmm. You know, think for a moment. In Washington, D.C., one third of the kids live in households or 30 percent of the kids live in households who don't have Internet connections. In Detroit, it might be as high as 60 percent. Mm -hmm. And think about those households, those students, their creativity, their power to contribute to their community, their economy, to grow things that we need. Yeah. Not connecting them is economic loss. It's not that it's expensive. It's also economic loss. So I think what you described actually is a something that we have to frame um, internet access within broadband connections more broadly nationwide. It's like how we have to think about it, about what we're losing by not connecting everyone. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, so we've pretty much made it through my list, which I, I'm very excited about. Um, I think we have about five minutes left. Um, really the last thing that I would like to swing back around to um, is this idea that we already touched on of the trust responsibility. And um, you know, having this opportunity to speak to you, especially publicly, I would be remiss if I didn't really just drive the point home that um, this is something that Native nations take so very seriously. And it's something that we have been disappointed um, by the United States over and over again. And so I have asked um, other people in the FCC what their take is or, or how the trust, what their trust responsibility means to them. And I've been disappointed because sometimes the answer that I get is kind of like, well, it means being nice to tribes. Yeah. And as um, I'm sure you know, the trust responsibility means so much more than that. And um, it really is a government to government relationship. And um, so I guess I'm interested, uh, one, I would just like to encourage you so much to um, you know, visit Native Nations. I'm sure you have already, but yeah. to, to visit them more and, and just to understand the, the beauty of them um, and the importance of protecting that and allowing that to flourish. Um, these different cultures, but but too, I'm also interested in, and I'm going to put a little bit of pressure on you here, um, of just how how you can utilize your position and um, you know really speak to your colleagues and and be a leader and set the culture of making that important within the agency that you are one of the heads of, and um, so I'm just. I guess it's not even a, really a question, it's more of a statement, um, but I, I just hope that you can really take that to heart moving forward even more than you already do. Okay, I've got homework. 
I understand. <laughs> um, I would like to see the agency recommit to that policy statement. I think it would force a reckoning with how we've fallen short in recent years. And I think it's important to publicly do that. Mm -hmm. I'd also like us to see how we can make our Native Nations Task Force um, mm -hmm. integrate them more into our work. You know, not just have them on the margins, but figure out, for instance, when we're mapping where broadband is and is not, why don't we ask them to take those maps back to their communities? Help us validate, because you know what? I think their lived experience is extraordinarily valuable and we should figure out how to incorporate it into the data gathering and work we do. So I'd like to find more real world ways to integrate. And that's just one of them that I've been thinking about, but also, um, like I said before, updating the policy statement. Yeah, thank you. I would love to see that as well. Um, is there anything that I haven't asked you about or that we haven't touched on that uh, you would like to you know, tell, I, I have no idea how many people are watching. It, it, it could just be you and me and my mom watching. <laughs> right. I have no idea. But um, is there anything that you would, uh, you know, would like to share? Um, just that, uh, look, these are complicated days for internet access and it can bring us together. It can push us apart. But I remain convinced that the future belongs to the connected. We have got to figure out how to connect everyone in this country and this world, and then compel ourselves to use those connections to do good things for the public and for human rights. And I still, as an optimist, I'm impatient, but I think it's possible. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Well, I think we are about out of time. Um, again, I would just like to express all of my gratitude for your time. I know you are so busy over there right now, and, and this was, um, a nice break for me from being out in the rain on the trail, even though it's uh, beautiful. It's been very. It sounds wet. gorgeous. I don't know. It sounds really, really beautiful. It's so beautiful. Um, and um, but yeah, thank you so much. I I'm thank honored. You. And I appreciate your time. Thank you for your advocacy. <laughs> thank you.